Well, it is Mother's Day, so I thought, let's talk about moms a little bit today. On this day that we honor mothers, it's good for us to think about how much the ladies in our lives really do. You know, being a mom, frankly, I've watched firsthand. I've got a mom. I've got a wife who's a mom. Being a mom is not really a walk in the park, right? Did you know that by the time a child turns 18 years of age, that a mother has handled some extra 18,000 hours of work on behalf of that child? 18,000. It's 1,000 hours a year, specifically, only taking care of a child on top of everything else she's got to do, right? That's pretty awesome. So thank you, moms. There was a, a junior high school science teacher. And he had given this long, involved lecture one day to his students about magnets. He spoke for the entire hour of class about magnets. And then the next day, as oftentimes happens in junior high, he gave his students a quiz. And the very first question read like this. It said, my name begins with an M, it has six letters, and I pick things up. What am I? Over half the class wrote mother. <laughs> right? I'm not sure if they got credit or not, but, you know. And, and that story reminds me of a father who was trying to explain the concept of marriage to his four-year-old daughter. So he got out his wedding album because he thought, you know, maybe the visual imagery would help her understand what went on with the wedding service and everything else. And they went through the book page after page looking at all the beautiful pictures of mom and dad and, and the wedding party and all of that. And when they got to the last page and he closed the book, the little girl looked at him and said, Daddy, is that when mommy came to work for us? <laughs> yeah. There are some great portraits of motherhood in Scripture. You know, I love the, 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 the story, the imagery, the picture of the mother of Moses who cared so deeply for Moses that she intentionally broke the law in order to teach him the faith of her people. Or how about the mother of James and John, right? Interesting lady in the New Testament. She loves her boys so much that she wants to make sure that they get to sit at the right hand of Jesus in heaven, right? Remember that story where she's, she's pestering Jesus about it? Yeah, that, that's a dedicated mom to go to the Christ and say, hey, how about my boys in your right hand, right? Or how about the, the mother of King Lemuel? Uh, she gives some great advice to her son about godly living and how to pick a godly wife. We find that in Proverbs 31. You may be familiar with it. You've probably heard a Mother's Day sermon on it. That's not going to be my focus. But she gives him some great wisdom about picking a wife and what impact that'll have on his life. See, a mother can make a significant spiritual impact on her children. Now today, though, I'd like to introduce you to another story, however, out of Scripture, about a young woman named Eunice. Now she was raised in a religious home, and she was greatly impacted by her mother, Lois. And she loved to learn the different stories from the Scripture when she was young, and she enjoyed going to worship services where she could learn about God. Now, as she approached her teenage years, she was still focused on spiritual matters, but she became attracted to a young man who wasn't religious at all. And against the best wishes of her godly mother, against the teachings of her faith, and even probably against the tug of her own conscience, she married that young man. Now don't get me wrong, he was a, a nice guy, but he kind of thought spiritual matters were for weak people. Now after a couple of years of marriage, Eunice and her husband have a baby boy, a baby boy the name Timothy, in fact. And in the meantime, Eunice's dad has died, and so they ask her mother, Lois, to come and live with them. And, and little Timmy was a delight to everyone. Both his mother and his grandmother spent hour upon hour with him, teaching him, telling him the stories of the Old Testament, making sure he gets those poured into him, that he grows up in the faith, training him in the things of God. Now, while they didn't have any veggie tales back in those days, they didn't have any videos, they didn't have VBS, they didn't have youth groups, they didn't get to go to Spring Blitz or anything like that, mom and grandma created an environment where Tim 
could spiritually flourish. Then one day, along comes a preacher, a man by the name of Paul, comes to their town, the town of Lystra, and he begins speaking about this man named Jesus. Now both Lois and Eunice listen with great intensity. And they saw in Jesus the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament. And in that moment, they put their faith, their trust, their hope in him. Now these new believers turn their focus to begin to learn and study under Paul. And then from that, they take those things that they learn, they bring them home, and they begin to teach it to this young man, Timothy. And they begin to tell Timothy all about who Jesus was. And we know from the reading of the book of Acts that Paul himself even begins to take a personal interest in Tim, the teenager. And Paul partners with mother and grandmother both, leading young Timothy to saving faith. Later on, Paul and Timothy partner together in ministry as the gospel continues to spread throughout the region. And years and years later, while Paul's actually in prison, awaiting his own execution, Paul writes two letters to young Timothy. And it's in those two letters, those letters contain some teaching about how Timothy should behave, about how he should go about as a leader within the church. And they're also filled with a little bit of Paul's own reminiscing about their relationship, a little bit of nostalgia, so to speak, on Paul's part. And as Paul writes these letters, we know them as First and Second Timothy, of course, he reflects on the mothers who made such a big impact on Timothy's life. So with that as the background, I'd like to show how a mother and a grandmother, and in fact, any of you women, Having biological children doesn't mean you don't mother, right? I've been mothered by many women who are not my own biological mother. Some of you still do it today, right? That's okay. I can handle it. But I'd like to show how a mother and a grandmother, and in fact any woman of faith, can make a significant spiritual impact on our children. The first way that a mother can do this is by instilling within her children a respect for Scripture. We see this in the story of Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.12. Paul reminds Timothy that everyone wants to live, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus is going to be persecuted, right? Woohoo! We didn't cheer there. But Paul does remind Timothy that it's not always going to be easy. And then in verse 14, Paul urges Timothy to hang tough when those tough times come. It is well with my soul, right? And he says, but as, far, but, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, young Timothy, because you know those from who you learned it. Okay? You've learned this, Timothy. You know this, Timothy. You know this beyond just the cognitive thing. You've seen this, in the women's lives who've poured their faith into you. So Timothy, don't just know this cognitively, but be convicted and convinced of its truthfulness. Don't just have it in your head, Timothy, but internalize it and live these truths out. And now I think as we read the story of Timothy, we we see that he indeed is able to do this because he saw this modeled in his mother, and his grandmother. He saw them as servants. He saw them as loving. He saw them as women who were studious in the scripture and wanted to grow in faith. They were tremendous examples for young Timothy. Then in 2 Timothy 3.15, it shows us what this truth was. It says, and this is Paul again writing to Timothy, he says, and how from infancy, Timothy, You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. In the manner of devout Israelites, Grandmother Lois and Mother Eunice taught the Holy Scripture regularly to Timothy from the very beginning, from his infancy, it tells us in Scripture. From when he was a newborn babe, 
They were sharing the word of God with him. Lewis and Eunice team up to provide a high-powered, lifelong Bible study for Timothy, even before the boy learned to crawl. They read to him, probably told him stories about Samson and Samuel and David and Ruth and Abraham and Noah, right? They did everything they could to read to provide an environment for Timothy, the opportunity to learn, to grow, so that he too would take that on as his own personal faith. These two mothers had the word of God in their heart. And because they had internalized these truths and made it part of their day-to-day lives, they could impress upon young Timothy by talking about it throughout the day, by living it in everything that they did. Every moment he saw in them the living Word of God. Mothers, it's never too early to start teaching the Bible to your children. And mothers, it's never too late to start teaching the Bible to your children. There's nothing in this world that can replace your role in your child's life. Whether your child is my age and 40, 60, 6, 2, 10, 100, it doesn't matter. You're still our mothers, and you still have influence. So invest in us the Word of God. Help us to have a healthy respect for the Bible. Continue to show us, through your love, mothers, what it is to first be loved. Now thankfully, you don't have to do this all by yourselves. Fathers... Fathers are expected to take a primary role in this as well. And we as a church want to come alongside of the moms. We don't just say, moms, it's all your job, right? No, we want to come alongside. You saw some examples earlier. We've got a youth pastor and a great high school youth group. We want to help grow faith in our children. We have a a fantastic team of people who worked tremendously hard this year in our Wednesday night children's program, our kids club. We want to come alongside you there. We have Sunday school in the mornings where, where families came together and learned the Bible there. We have vacation Bible schools and all kinds of other neat opportunities to help raise up children in the ways of the Lord. But the first place where almost every child ever sees the Bible is in his mother, is in her mother. It's in you ladies. Because we see it in you first. Live it. Love it. Be it. Be the word of God to us moms. Because it all starts at home. So the first Bible that many of us read is our very own mothers. And and then eventually our parents, our fathers as well. So the question I have, ladies, is what kind of Bible are you to those around you? You don't have to answer that out loud. But if you're not where you want to be, that's okay. Spirituality is a journey. Our our faith is a journey. We're justified, and we can become Christians. But that process of sanctification takes time. But moms, let's be intentional about it. And if there's a way that I as a pastor or we as a church can come alongside you to equip you or encourage you to help you be a better version of the Bible to the people around you, let us know because we're here to help. Let us know because we want you to succeed. We want you to be shining models of Jesus Christ's love in your family's life. The second way that you make an impact in the lives of your children is by instilling within them an authentic faith. We see this out of 2 Timothy 1.5. I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I, Paul, am persuaded now that it lives in you, Timothy. Even though Lois and Eunice were believers, Timothy needed to come to a point at which he put his own personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Because, you see, faith is not hereditary. It's learned. And it's chosen. And at the same time, while these mothers model this genuine faith, they create an environment where their child is in the best situation to be motivated to want that very same relationship 
that these ladies had. And we know from Scripture, we know that these women had real faith without any, any pretense, without any false errors. These were godly women. And faith had come and taken up residence in their lives, in his mother and grandmother's heart. And these two mothers were completely sold out for Christ. And they were fully devoted and completely committed. And Timothy knew it. No one knows better than a child whether or not a parent's faith is genuine. Our kids see right through us. They really do. So moms, if you want to instill in your children authentic faith, you've got to take your own faith seriously as well. Because if you're just going through the spiritual motions, kind of a zombie, you walk into church, you walk out of church, and that's your relationship with Jesus, your kids are going to see that. They're going to see transparently through it. And the unfortunate reality is our kids are impacted by that. I wish as a parent that my own problems in life weren't so impactful on my own child, right? I wish my bad habits didn't have an influence over my son. But they do. Now I'm thankful that my good habits also have an impact on my son. That I sit down and read the Bible with him and get to do things of faith with him. My wife takes him to summer camp because, you know, as a pastor sometimes it's hard to get away for that weekend. But she'll go to summer camp with him to Bible camp. He remembers those things. He has fun. And so it takes an intentionality, mothers. Being intentional about helping our children whatever age they are. Encouraging them to grow in an authentic faith. The third way that we can impact our children is to instill in them, and this is perhaps the most important of the three, is to instill in our children an authentic desire to minister to others. After Paul preached in Lystra, and Timothy had been converted, he returns a short while later, and, and if you were trying to follow along in your Bible today, I'm all over the place, but if you were, it's Acts 16, Acts 16, 1 through 3. It says, he came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewish and a believer, but whose father was Greek. The brothers at Lystra and at Iconian spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on his journey. So Paul's out starting churches. He comes and he, he, he gets the background on Timothy and says, I want to take this guy with me as I go start churches all over the Mediterranean. He's got what it takes. And in that I see in Timothy these three qualities that are no doubt passed down from his mother and his grandmother. The first, clearly Timothy was a strong believer. Luke refers to Timothy as a disciple. Luke, of course, is the author of Acts. And he could have referred to Timothy as anything. He could have said, Timothy the believer, Timothy the brother. But no, he says, Timothy the disciple. Now, a disciple is a follower, a learner. A disciple is one who is serious about Christ, not just one who goes through the motions. And I think the second thing we see out of Timothy from this is that he has a good reputation, right? Paul shows up, and there's guys from two towns talking about how good a follower of Jesus that Timothy is. People knew him as a man of integrity and as a man of the word. Again, he got that from his mother and from his grandmother. And the third thing we see about Timothy is simply Timothy is available. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. And as you continue to read the book of Acts, you'll see that Timothy was eager to go and minister along with Paul. He knew, of course, it meant leaving home. He knew it meant leaving these two incredibly influential women who had done so much for him in his life. He knew, Paul had warned him, this means hardship is going to come. But he knew that he had been called and he had been equipped, that he had first been loved so that he could go and love others. Mothers, it's 
part of your responsibility, in fact, to install in us as your children a respect for the Bible and a love for faith. Now, that doesn't mean it's all on you. It's not. The Holy Spirit's got to work. Someday I'll tell you my story. I keep saying that, and I haven't told you my story. But I was that kid who, who was drugged to church for 20 years. I was that kid who never missed Sunday school. I was that kid who was always at VBS. My mom and dad sang in the church choir, so I would be there on Wednesdays while they would practice. My mom and dad watered all the plants at our church, and there's like 100 plants in that church. So this was some dedication. I mean, we'd go for hours and water plants at different times of the year. My mom was the lady who a couple times a year would bake all the bread for communion for two different services for hundreds and hundreds of people. So I would be at the church with my mom, pulling bread out of the oven. And I was the kid that, despite all of that, didn't come to faith until I was an adult. Is that my mom's fault? No. My mom and dad did everything they could have. So moms, if it hasn't happened yet for your kids, don't give up. Right? I love to hear those stories of moms and grandmothers who pray, right? When I was in a church in Mitchell, South Dakota, I had this lady. She was a prayer warrior. And she had been praying and praying for 55 years that her son would come to know the Lord. One night, we come in on a Tuesday evening, we had a prayer meeting, come in, and she's just in tears. We think something horrible's happened. This is not a really emotional kind of woman. She's a stoic Swedish Baptist. She didn't sit in the front row either. She's crying. We're like, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong. Why are you crying? And we sit down and we start talking. And she says, for 55 years I've been praying for my son. He's gone so far from the Lord. Many of us knew some of the stories. And she said, he called me. He loves Jesus and he's getting baptized this weekend. The whole place was bawling. So sometimes moms, it just takes some dedication. Sometimes moms, it's just going to the prayer closet, being persistent, never giving up. Never giving up the hope that someday Jesus will work on your child's heart. So if it hasn't happened, mom, that doesn't mean it's your fault. Don't give up. Keep at it. Because you still have an impact. You still have an influence. You still can make a difference in their lives. The reason we raise our kids in the ways of the Lord is so that they learn the Bible and they grow in their faith and they become difference makers in the world so that they can go on themselves and share their faith with others so that they can go on and minister in the church and in their schools and in their jobs and wherever they go. Hopefully, maybe some of them will go on even to be missionaries, right? So they can go on and love those who are hurting. So that they can help others identify their own spiritual gifts so that they can serve on a regular basis. That is what we want. And that's how we as a church want to encourage you moms. If we can help you in any way, let us know. I want to close this morning by reading a poem entitled My Mother. It says, Your love I know, I've seen your tears. You've given to me life. You've walked through hours and days and years of heartaches, toil, and strife. To see that I could have the best, you could that you, let me try that again. To see that I could have the best that you could give to me, you gave up needs and often rest, you viewed eternity. To do his will, my highest call, and by your special care, I stood and walked and did not fall, you held me up in prayer. Though strands of gray may brush your hair and miles might divide our way, I know that by your quiet prayer, you've helped me day by day. You've shown me how to give, to share, to put my own needs last. You've helped me 
to see and be aware that life is so soon past. To spite your love I would not dare, for there's not another who spreads her gentle love and care like you, my loving mother. I want to applaud all of you mothers who take the task of being a mother seriously, who understand the spiritual impact you have on your children's lives. And as Proverbs 31.28 says, her children will arise and call her blessed. So from all of us, to all of you who mother in any sort of way, thank you. We have been blessed. Thank you for pouring your lives into us each and every one of you mothers. Amen.